This econometrics video will introduce time series modeling, including a discussion of serial correlation. By the end of this video, you should be able to interpret the meaning of the jth autocorrelation of a time series, use software to estimate an autoregressive model of order p, calculate a forecast and forecast error using an autoregressive uh, model of order p, use the Bayes information criterion to estimate the correct lag length of an autoregressive model, use software to estimate an autoregressive distributed lag model of order p, q, and use the root mean squared forecast error to interpret the precision of a forecast. Let's start our discussion by making sure we're on the same page about what time series data means. Broadly speaking, there are three types of econometric data. Cross-sectional data describe many entities but one time period. For example, if you had information about individual students at a university at one particular point in time, uh, this would be cross-sectional uh, data where the entity is the student. Panel data contains information about many entities and many time periods. For example, if you had uh, information about the populations in each US state, but you also had that information annually from 1990 to 2010, uh, you are observing both many entities, namely states, and many time periods, namely years, so you have uh, panel data. In time series data, we observe one entity, but many time periods. For example, if we had information about United States economic indicators, uh, but we have that information monthly from 1970 to 2018, uh, we are describing a single entity, the United States, uh, but we're observing uh, it over many time periods. Time series data tends to be more common in macroeconomics and finance topics. Uh, one nice thing about time series data sets is that because we're observing only one entity, uh, it is relatively easy to display uh, time series data graphically. So for example, uh, this graph that you see here shows the US inflation rate over time from 1970 to the end of 2017. Uh, we might wonder, for example, uh, looking at this graph, uh, what do you think the U.S. inflation rate will be in the next month? Uh, so if you can imagine that it's the end of 2017, uh, we didn't have information about the inflation rate in 2018, um, we might uh, try to look at this graph to uh, predict what the inflation rate would be at the beginning of 2018. You might hypothesize that the inflation rate at the beginning of 2018 is fairly similar to the inflation rate at the end of 2017. Uh, this would be a reasonable hypothesis uh, because many observations of time series variables are related to one another uh, in nearby time periods. Uh, this uh, principle that time series variables often tend to be uh, dependent uh, across observations uh, can sometimes help us to predict time series variables, but at the same time, uh, the fact that observations generally are not independent uh, also uh, creates some challenges. In particular, dependent observations uh, tend to carry less information uh, than independent observations, uh, and this is something that we're going to have to account for uh, when trying to draw statistical inferences. Uh, so to build on this idea that the observations are uh, not independent, we'll introduce the idea of autocorrelation. Time series autocorrelation, also called serial correlation, is a relationship between a variable and its lags. And when we say it's lags, we mean that the values of that same variable observed in an earlier time period. Uh, more technically, the jth autocovariance is the covariance of some variable uh, y observed at time t, and that same variable y observes j periods before time t. In other words, the, the j refers to the number of periods that we have lagged that variable. Similarly, the jth autocorrelation, uh, also denoted with the Greek letter rho, is the correlation between those two variables, uh, y and uh, j lags of y. Uh, and uh, recall that the correlation uh, can also be calculated from a covariance and a variance term. Recall that correlations range from negative one to positive one. Uh, so if we observe an autocorrelation which is close to positive one, that means that a variable and its lags tend to have a strong positive correlation. 
Uh, so for example, if we found a high autocorrelation uh, for inflation, uh, then that would suggest that uh, inflation in one period is probably fairly likely to predict inflation in uh, the next period. Uh, we can measure autocorrelations fairly easily in many statistical software programs. For example, in Stata, when we write an L followed by a dot followed by a variable name, uh, that uh, indicates a one period lag of the variable Y. We could also do L2 dot for a two period lag and L3 dot for a three period lag. Sometimes we may want to dig a little bit deeper and understand how the changes in a time series variable relate to one another over time. One way to do this is uh, first to measure the first differences of a variable. Uh, specifically, that means uh, the value of the variable at time t minus the value of the variable in the previous time period, t minus 1. Uh, this is something that is, uh, again, often possible to calculate easily in statistical software. Uh, if you're using Stata, you can do uh, d dot uh, followed by the variable name. That will give you that first difference. And then we may ask, uh, for example, how is the first difference of a variable related to the first difference in the previous period or even uh, more periods before that? So for example, if the first difference of inflation had a positive autocorrelation of order one, that would mean that uh, if inflation were to increase from one period to the next, it is also uh, more likely to increase in the period after that. Uh, with this idea of autocorrelation in mind, uh, we may wish to uh, use this fact to our advantage when tr trying to predict the value of a time series variable. And to do this, we can use what, what's uh, called an autoregressive model. Uh, that model predicts a time series variable using its lags. So a simple autoregressive model, uh, which we denote AR1, uh, or an autoregressive model of order 1, uh, simply regresses a time series variable y time t on its first lag. So we say it has order 1 uh, because uh, the, ind only, only, the only independent variable in the model is the dependent variable, but lagged one period earlier. We could use such a model to make a forecast, which is a predicted value about a future time period. So for example, if we were to estimate this AR1 model, then we would use the estimated coefficients beta zero hat and beta one hat. Uh, we may want to predict the value of that variable at time capital T plus one. In this case, the capital T is denoting the last time period that we uh, have in our data set. Perhaps it represents uh, the current time period. Uh, so we're going to predict what's going to happen in the next time period based only on information that we have available in the current time period, capital T. After we actually realize uh, the value of that time series variable in the next time period, capital T plus one, we could calculate a forecast error. That's simply the difference between the realized value of our time series variable and the forecast. We could also construct more complex autoregressive models. So for example, an ARP model or an autoregressive model of order P uh, would have, again, Y as a dependent variable, uh, but it could have multiple lags of the dependent variable uh, as explanatory variables. Specifically, we say that the order of the model is P because the greatest lag length that we observe anywhere in the model is P periods before the current time. Uh, so in particular, that means that if we were to eliminate one of uh, the uh, lower lag length, it would still be a model of order P. Uh, so this raises a question about how we go about selecting uh, the appropriate lag length or the appropriate order of a model. So suppose that I wanted to uh, create a time series model to predict future inflation. Well, I could use an AR1 model where I use last period's inflation to predict this period's. I could use an AR2 model where I also allow there to be uh, an effect of inflation two periods ago. I could use an AR3 model, uh, so on and so forth. How do we make the decision of the correct lag length? Uh, 
Uh, one thing that may be tempting is to use a statistic such as r squared or the sum of squared residuals. But one thing to note is that as we add more lags, as we increase the order of the autoregressive model, it should be the case that r squared is always going to increase. Uh, r squared should never go down as we add more explanatory variables. Uh, similarly, the sum of the squared residuals is always going to decrease as we add more explanatory variables. Uh, so doing something like maximizing R squared or minimizing sum of squared residuals uh, probably isn't the right criterion here uh, because we should find that uh, as we keep adding these additional explanatory variables, uh, we always uh, improve in that sense. Uh, yet this doesn't seem like the right answer to always add as many lag lengths as possible. An alternative is to use what's known as the Bayes information criterion. Uh, we won't get into the technical details, uh, but this formula shows how it's calculated. And uh, I'll point out one simple idea. Uh, notice that we said that as we add additional uh, uh, lag lengths, in other words, as we increase the order P, uh, we should find that the sum of squared residuals decreases. And you'll notice the sum of squared residuals is in this first term. And so as we increase P, we should find that this first term is going to tend to decrease as we add uh, additional uh, uh, terms to the model, as we increase the order. However, you'll also notice that there is a P directly in this second term. And so as we increase the order, we should find that this term increases. Uh, so the proposal is to select the lag length P that minimizes the Bayes information criterion. And intuitively, uh, you can think of this second term in the, the BIC formula as penalizing uh, adding too many additional uh, lags to our model. Uh, one additional type of model that we uh, may consider when modeling a time series variable is called an autoregressive distributed lag model, or ADL model. This is going to predict a time series variable using that own variable's uh, lags, but also one or more independent variables. So for example, if I wanted to model inflation, perhaps uh, I, I don't only want to use uh, the previous period's inflation rates, I'd also like to use some other economic indicator. Uh, more technically, we say that an ADL model of order PQ contains P lags of the dependent variable and Q lags of the independent variable. Uh, so although this uh, equation here perhaps looks a little bit messy, uh, simply note that uh, the dependent variable Y depends on lags of the dependent variable and uh, the lags go up to P periods before the current time period T, uh, hence the order P. Uh, in addition, we have some other variable, an independent variable xt, but we also add on lags. And the greatest lag that we have for the independent variable x is q periods before the current, uh, current period. So there are clearly many different types of ADL models based on uh, the dependent and independent variables and the lags included. Uh, one common practice, however, is to exclude uh, the uh, xt term, uh, in other words, the independent variable with no lags. Uh, the reason is that if I'm trying to use an ADL model to predict the value of some dependent variable in a future time period, uh, if I had that xt term, I would also have to have the value of that independent variable in a future time period. Uh, and so sometimes it's more desirable to have a model where uh, yt, uh, the thing that I'm trying to measure in one time period, depends only on uh, values of variables measured uh, before that time period. So just to illustrate this definition a little bit better, uh, let's look at two different examples. Um, so I'd like to write down what type of ADL model uh, each uh, uh, this equation is describing. Uh, so first notice that there is a y t minus one uh, term on the right hand side, but I don't see any additional lags of y. And so this means that uh, my ADL model has an order of one for the dependent variable. I also see terms for x uh, 
with a one period lag and with a two period lag. So the highest lag there is two. So that makes this an ADL one comma two model. Let's look at one other example. Here we notice that uh, Y is lagged by two periods in this term. Um, note that it's not necessarily a problem that I have not lagged Y by a single time period. So I still have an ADL model with order two for the dependent variable because the largest lag I see is two periods in the past. Uh, I also do not see uh, an independent variable and so I'm going to put a zero here uh, for the order corresponding to the independent variable. Uh, one thing you may notice is that uh, this is also an AR2 model because it is purely autoregressive. I don't have an independent variable at all. And so you could think of AR models as a subset of ADL models. Uh, so one important question when we are modeling these uh, the various uh, variables using AR models or ADL models is uh, just how precise are the forecasts that we make. Uh, so recall we introduced this idea of a forecast error, which is the difference between the realized value and the predicted value. Uh, but one uh, downside of this forecast error is that it can only be calculated after the outcome is realized. Uh, in other words, we would have to uh, wait uh, until we observe the actual outcome to know how far off we are. Uh, it seems like it would be more useful to know how precise the forecast is likely to be uh, before we have to wait uh, for the outcome. One way that we can do this is to measure what's known as the root mean squared forecast error. So notice that uh, we're going to work for, uh, from the inside and go out. So the very inside of this equation is the forecast error. In other words, how far off uh, was the uh, forecast? We're going to uh, square that. That's going to make all of these errors uh, positive, these squared errors. Uh, we're going to find the expected value. Um, in practice, we could do something like take the mean. And then we're going to take the square root. Uh, so this root mean squared forecast error should give us a sense of how large we can expect a typical forecast error to be in magnitude. Uh, this is something that fortunately many statistical software packages uh, are capable of calculating. Uh, for example, something labeled the root mean squared error uh, is probably at least a pretty good approximation of the root mean squared forecast error. Uh, one thing we could do with that root mean squared forecast error is to create a forecast interval, which is simply a confidence interval corresponding to the forecast. Uh, so just like we've done with other confidence intervals, uh, we're going to start with the forecasted value that's going to be the center of this confidence interval. And then we're going to add or subtract a value to get the ends of that confidence interval. So we're going to uh, multiply a critical T statistic, uh, which would correspond to uh, our, um, our level of confidence, uh, and then multiply that by the root mean squared forecast error. So to illustrate where this uh, type of calculation may be useful, uh, let's turn to some information that uh, the Bank of England produces. They're, they were one of the leaders in uh, communicating the uncertainty of uh, financial forecasts. Uh, they create um, uh, what's sometimes called a, a fan chart. Uh, this graph is showing uh, the actual uh, inflation uh, on the left side of the graph, the solid red line. And then on the right side of the graph, it is showing uh, not just the Bank of England's forecast of future inflation, uh, but also these shaded bars, which uh, show the, the level of confidence. So the shaded bars um, are the forecast intervals. Uh, so one thing you'll see is that uh, those uh, bars spread out fairly quickly over time. Uh, so they're indicating that uh, for, say, one quarter out, uh, they are fairly confident uh, that of their, uh, uh, their forecast of inflation. Uh, but as soon as you go about a year into the future, and especially as you go a little bit beyond a year, uh, you'll see that there's a very, very wide forecast interval. In other words, uh, they're conceding that they actually know very little information uh, about inflation farther in the future. Uh, and in fact, this idea is uh, fairly common uh, that predicting uh, a variable like inflation far into the future is really very, very difficult.